Well, when you return home with an armful of goodies from a farmer's market like that, you'll want to cook something fresh. Then again, you may also want to put away some of that delicious summer produce for the colder months that are surely on the way. I'm Cindy Putman and we're here with Chef Hal in the Live Green Galley and we're so excited because today we're going to be talking to you about the best ways to preserve all these wonderful things that you've been growing in your garden or in your raised garden or even in a small container garden. And Chef Hal, thank you. It smells wonderful already. Thank you. Nice to be back in the Green Galley. Um, we're excited to just show everybody a little bit about how we preserve some of our last harvest um, at the restaurant, at home. Um, we're going to focus on some things that are fairly popular in terms of tomatoes, peppers, corn, and basil. Um, I think we can just go ahead okay, and... Okay, what are we going to get started yeah, with? We can start with uh, some tomatoes. Um, we're getting some of the last tomatoes from one of our local growers in East Nashville right now at the restaurant. And what we like to do with the tomatoes is just kind of stew them down with a little bit of olive oil, garlic, salt, and pepper, and let them simmer um, very low heat for maybe an hour to two hours, um, releasing some of the water. And uh, that would, of course, magnify the flavor of the tomato um, before we would ultimately um, jar the tomato. And the kinds of tomatoes you have I absolutely love because these look like heirloom tomatoes. They, and those are my favorite kind to get at the farmer's market. Not those really round perfect red ones but those that are all different colors and all different shapes and they're really really beautiful. They are beautiful and we have a couple of the raw tomatoes here that we've used for these. These are actually grown for us by CC Gardens in East Nashville. Um, we tend to focus on smaller tomatoes for this. Of course large tomatoes would be fine um, I like to slice those up and put them on sandwiches, but um, these are the ones that we use a lot in the restaurant for certain recipes. Of course, now that tomato season is coming to an end, um, we're, we're going to be jarring some up so that we can use some in, in February and January when uh, that nice, beautiful flavor of a nice tomato will, will be a little more precious than it is in, in June and July, being that they're gone and out of season. On a cold, wintry night, yes. when someone wants some really good homemade soups or pasta sauce or something like that, one of those cans of tomatoes would be worth its weight in gold. Absolutely, and it's, it's already kind of cooked for you and, and ready to go. Um, what we've done here with the jars is just the, the basic technique of jarring. We've, we've boiled and sanitized the jars and the lids. We've pulled them out, let them dry. Um, and you've you wanna, actually done that in the big cooker right over here. We have, we have. And, and, and here's an empty jar and, and we got our, our nice little funnel here and, and we can just simply fill this up until it gets to the top. You now wanna, do you try to put the extra liquid in or do you uh, leave out some of the extra liquid? I like to have a nice ratio of tomato to the liquid so that when you actually would uh, be using these at home, they wouldn't be too dry or too wet mm -hmm. uh, for depending on what recipe you wanted to actually use them for. So now we have the, the and, ring and, and they've and been the nicely lid. sanitized. And, and one thing, excuse me, I do want to show everybody is to always make sure, even if you use a, a nice funnel, you always want to make sure the, the rim is, is nicely uh, clean so the seal can actually take place there with the tomato and we'd put the, the lids on and, and seal them up and then this would go back into um, our, our nice little um, vessel here that's made primarily for canning and we'd boil that for about 10 to 15 minutes and, and pull out and um, we'd let it cool and one trick I would like to share with people that's always been a good trick for me to know that you have a good seal is this obviously we just filled so we haven't boiled it yet and you can see that you can still press, press on, the pan, on the top of the lid a little bit, where on this one you can't because the, the, it's taken place, the vacuum's taken place here and it hasn't taken place here yet. And we've also done um, some pepper relish that we have over here that we've already also jarred as well in the jars here. And, and what we've done here, you can see a beautiful basket of peppers that we have here from the garden. We've got a number of different variety of peppers there and, and I like to intermix all the different variety and we just kind of rough chop okay. them um, along with some onion and garlic. And then I use some water and vinegar and sugar and salt and, and kind of cook them down in that. And then there again with the same procedure, we'll, uh, we'll jar the pepper relish and this is just 
so great for so many things. Um, well, I'm thinking a big pot of pinto beans and a big pound of cornbread. That sounds this great. This would be perfect, that and it smells great. wonderful. It has a spicy smell and yet a sweet smell at the same time. When you're preparing your peppers, how important it is to take the seed? Is it to take the seed and the seed membrane out? I think it's important, um, especially with the hotter peppers, because that's going to obviously make them more hot. I typically just take my peppers, cut them in half lengthwise, of course discarding the top stem, and then after I cut them all in half, I'll go back and pull all the seeds out of them, and then I just kind of rough chop them a little bit. You could even put them in the food processor if you wanted to, and just maybe pulse it, and then get a nice kind of rough chop on it. Um, I think it's okay, though, for the peppers to kind of be a, a variety of size. Sizes. And, okay, what are we going to make next after we've had our peppers and we've got our wonderful tomato sauce? Um, then I'd like to maybe share how you can um, save and preserve some corn and some basil. Always at the end of the year, our, we have about 10 basil plants at Eastland Cafe and they just produce, produce, produce. And, and even right now, we have so much basil, but as it's starting to get colder outside, if we don't do something with them in the next two to three weeks, um, we could potentially lose a lot of product. So a very simple thing to do with basil is to just make a pesto. And um, we've made a pesto here um, yesterday actually at the restaurant. And we just simply use the, the basil leaves, some nice Parmesan cheese, some garlic, um, olive oil, salt, pepper, and we use toasted walnuts. Um, you know, original recipes for pesto will call for pine nuts, um, and pine nuts are wonderful and delicious. Mm. They do tend to kind of be on the pricier side of, of the nut family. Um, but we always have walnuts at the restaurant. I mean, you could use pecans, you could use almonds. I, I think the nut, you can do really whatever you want. And then we just use olive oil, and once again, in the food processor, we, we pulse it and, until we get the consistency that we want it. And with the pesto, I think you could freeze it in Tupperware, you could freeze it in ice cube trays, you could freeze it in Ziploc bags. Um, that'd be completely up to you what you wanted to actually freeze so it So it's in. a pretty versatile thing. You could do a lot of different things with this. I mean, freezing it a lot of different ways and then serving it a lot of different ways. Sure, and I think some people like the ice cube tray because after it freezes, then you can put it in a Ziploc bag and, and give it a good seal. If you had a food process, or I'm sorry, a food saver, um, that would be really nice. Um, but what the ice cube tray does is kind of give you a portion size. So, you know, you can take what you need and, and know you're not getting too much or not enough when, when you're actually going to be cooking your dinner. And so what would you add this to if you have this great pesto that comes out in an ice cube shape? I, I, I mean, I think a pasta kind of right off the bat. Um, we've even done things like mixing pesto with butter and serving it with fresh radishes before dinner. Um, which is a nice way to do it. Anything um, mixed with butter is good. Yeah, Anything, yeah. it doesn't matter what it is. So that's beautiful pesto. How long will that keep in the refrigerator if you're just going to keep it in the refrigerator and not freeze it or do anything else with uh, I'd it? I'd say in the refrigerator it should be good for at least a week. I think the kind of the, the way it has a layer of oil on top will kind of help it preserve itself with not allowing the oxygen mm -hmm. to, to penetrate. But you can see how it does oxidize a little bit on top, but as we mix it up, that, that beautiful green color kind of comes back out. Um, and it is, it is a beautiful, beautiful dish. And, and I love the way that you uh, said, you know, all the flavors mixed together because even when we stir it, you can just smell the aroma. It smells so, it so does, good. It does smell good. Okay, so we've got our pesto. Now, let me just ask you about these leaves. Uh -huh. Are there some leaves that you should not use because a few of these have just a little bit of browning on them? Does that affect at all what you should be using or um, what you should be choosing if you're going to do your pesto? I think if what you're looking at bothers you, you you can certainly discard it. Um, I always say if you wouldn't serve it to somebody you, you really care about, then, then don't serve it to anybody, you know. But um, yeah, we just pick the leaves off and uh, maybe give them a rinse because being that they do come from the garden, uh, we will find a, a, a small spider or, you know, some kind of little critter on there from time sure. to time. So you want to make sure that you be aware of that as you're using the, the food as you pull it from your garden. But this was just picked this morning. That's beautiful. And, is there any time you use a younger leaf as opposed to an older, you know, more mature leaf? I think sometimes I like to use the bigger leaves for the pesto. And then if you were using, you know, if you're cooking something fresh, you know, some of these smaller tops 
are are maybe nice to use as like a garnish mm -hmm. or something. I think so you know? too. Oh. Well, we love pesto at my house, and so I can't wait to go home. And I think my basil is really on overload right now. It's been really growing a lot, yeah. so I'm going to be able to make some of that for this weekend. Now, let's talk about corn. corn. Everybody loves corn. And corn is certainly one of those things that, I mean, when summertime starts getting here, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to corn and tomatoes. Those are like two things on the top of my on list. Big on top of a big old hot biscuit. Yes. That is a true southern thing on top of a big old cat head biscuit. But that corn is beautiful mm, corn. Is, this is beautiful corn. Um, it shucks so nicely. Uh, the, the silk on it. Um, we just got this at the Nashville Farmer's Market. And I mean, you can just see how nicely the, the husk pulls down. And there's not a lot of silk on there. It's very easy to shuck. Um, That's I, a perfect ear of corn, just right for this program, for a perfect, perfect day. It is very nice. Um, I have simmered some in some water with a little bit of salt and a little bit of sugar. Um, I think that kind of helps the, the flavor of the corn come through. And then I also have some raw. Uh, some people um, prefer to do this raw. Um, but what we want to do anyways is, is very carefully, and sometimes we set ourselves up a little barrier because the, the corn does tend to kind of yeah, go every which way. But we just want to cut about a half to a third of the kernel off. And then after we're done doing the whole ear, what we'll do is take the back of the knife and kind of go down the corn and um, add that into the corn. And then once we do this, we could just give it a quick saute and, and maybe some butter or some olive oil. And then what we really want to make sure we do is to absolutely let the corn cool 100% before we would then um, take some Ziploc bags and uh, obviously put the corn in the Ziploc bags, try to squeeze as much air out as possible, get a nice tight seal on it. Thank you so much, Chef Hal, for all these wonderful pointers on how to take care of these this last bountiful harvest that we have from our gardens or from our farmers market and we're so excited that you joined us here in the green galley and i'm so excited to taste some of these delicious things well thank you so much for having me